Welcome back to another episode of the Empowered Plates, Empowered Lives podcast, y'all. It's your healthy habits and lifestyle coach, Giovanni, and I help those with endometriosis and polycystic ovary syndrome reduce chronic pain, eliminate stress, and minimize irregular or heavy periods through my M to the third degree healing empowerment formula. Y'all, today, we got an international guest in the Good Vibes Studios. We got Sam, also known as Sav. Y'all, but before we get into this episode, and if you're new, welcome to the podcast, but it's time to vibe with me, y'all. Welcome to the Empowered Plates, Empowered Lives podcast. Get it, sad. There you go. Yeah, Y'all, we today are, we, we some... sit down with Sapphire, also known as Saf, the founder of Brown Girl Endo and a passionate advocate for endometriosis awareness. Y'all, Saf's journey of navigating endometriosis and the medical system led her to speak out and create a platform for underrepresented voices in the endo community. She is absolutely amazing, and I'm so excited for her to share her journey of strength all about advocating for her health, the importance of representation, and her mission to empower the BIPOC individuals to share their stories. Y'all, this episode is packed with powerful insights and practical advice on finding your voice, building community, and managing both the physical and mental challenges of endometriosis. Welcome to the Good Vibes Studio, Seth. Hi, it's really nice to be here with you finally. It's taken us a while to get here with it's um, okay. with having chronic illnesses and all that jazz, but it's really nice to finally just sit down with you. Agree. And I think that's a beautiful place to start is sometimes you just have to let life life and just kind of go with it and be able to show up when you can holistically, vibrantly. Um when it's beneficial and your body allows, right? And sometimes it might just take an hour and you say, okay, I'm gonna let my body do its thing. And then we're gonna get back to the regular scheduled program. And then sometimes it might take a few days, a few weeks to really get, you know, in alignment with your body and care for you. But it's all about showing up for you. Sapphire, what's, what's one word that could pretty much sum up or describe your journey of strength thus far with endometriosis? One word. Ooh, um... I would say uncertain. Mm. I think that's a good word. <laughs> I think that's a good word because even following you um, on Instagram, you're you're very visible and transparent with your story and your journey. And sometimes you're having good days. Sometimes you're having bad days. Sometimes it's the endometriosis. Sometimes it's not the endometriosis and it's something totally different and not even related to it. So I see why. Um, you would say uncertain, but give your spin on why do you believe uncertain is a good word to describe your journey of strength thus far with endometriosis? I think because I initially had symptoms as a teenager and I managed that with the hormonal birth control pill for so for so long. I think it was maybe seven, seven years, I want to say, until my symptoms showed again. And then within the last sort of two years, things have either gone really, really well or really bad really quickly like I've had ups and downs within the space of a few days weeks even when I look at it now the, this whole year has been really up and down for me and I think that's why everything feels so uncertain because to an extent I managed to get my endometriosis to a place where it was manageable in about July but then other health problems just showed and then that's the other uncertainty living with so it just feels like there's not there's not like a steady a steady line or a steady progression. It is up and down, and that's I've tried to process that healing isn't linear. To not stress myself about out stress myself out about the fluctuations or the like the sudden lows because it can be so sudden. I can feel normal, and then it can be really really difficult. So to help with that stress, trying to keep that at the frame of mind, it is very hard to do that sometimes but trying to get back to that route and if you have that support system to help tell you 
but I, like my partner always says healing isn't linear and sometimes it's like I know but also it helps to be reminded of that because I might not necessarily be thinking of that while my symptoms whatever they are are very high I like it. One, I love that you talked about your support system because that is certain. That is definitely going to yeah. be there. And you have found stability in having a support system and them reassuring you that this is something that's hard, but you're able to do hard things um, and that you're navigating it the best way you can. And you're being mindful of your decisions to show up for you. So I love that you have a good support system. Um, and I, I also like that you talked about how you can just all of a sudden start feeling, you know, these mm -hmm. onset of different symptoms. And you're like, what is going on? What is happening? Uh, for me, it was like, did I have food poisoning? Like, why am I yeah. like nauseous and want to throw up? And my stomach is just like, did anybody else eat what I ate? And y'all feel bad? Like, is it just me? That's how the first, uh, I guess, kind of flare up kind of hit me. Um, that was kind of like weird. And I think it was distress um, that and we know distress exacerbates our pain, exacerbates our symptoms of feeling nauseous. Um, and so I, I think that was the first time. And then the second, it was just debilitating, can't move, hunched over, barely can walk. And that's when my nurse practitioner told me I needed to go to the ER to get imaging. And that's when they saw this large uh, cyst on my right ovary. And I'm guessing it, it had ruptured. And so then that started my my uh, navigation of going through and realizing, you know, I ended up having stage four endometriosis, adenomyosis on the left side um, of my pelvic mm -hmm. uh, area, muscular area. And, you know, PCOS was there. Irregular periods were always something I had. Um, and then just looking at some of the symptoms that people with endometriosis, I was like, okay, like you said earlier, yeah. I, this, like, since I've been younger, like I've experienced these symptoms before, had no idea it was due to like a chronic condition that was going on in my body. So let's take it back to the beginning. Um, Sav, I think you told me it was about what, November 22, was it November yeah. 22, November 22 and two, you, um, quickly had to become like this advocate, you know, for yourself and for, uh, brown girl endo can you share what inspired you to kind of start speaking out about your experiences especially as someone who felt underrepresented in the endometriosis community so november 2022 was when my symptoms started but i didn't start my instagram until this year in february largely because my symptoms february 2024 just to give y'all context yeah so sorry when when yeah. you watch this episode go ahead Sam. yeah so it was the sort of rapid decline from when my symptoms first started i will remember i was at a comedy show i was sat down i thought i didn't think i couldn't go because i was on my period my periods have been fine and i remember being sat there and having such severe lower back pain like someone had shoved a rod in my back it was constantly twisting it like i felt mm -hmm. myself getting warm like flushed and i felt really nauseous and I couldn't really concentrate on what was happening. It felt really, really odd to me. But the sort of scary thing was after the show, there was a few flights of stairs to where the car was parked. And uh, every footstep was like searing pain in my body. By the time we'd got to the top floor where the car was parked, I felt so sweaty in the car. I felt really nauseous, like I was going to throw up. I never had that sort of extreme pain or symptoms with my periods. So not long after that, that's when I went to my GP because I was like, this is very weird. Maybe there is like a cyst or something. It didn't, I didn't really think of any endometriosis or anything like that at that time. But it was not, it was after that sort of, they were requesting to do imaging. So the ultrasound is the first thing that they'll do. And um, I had to wait until the Christmas period for it to happen. But during Christmas, again, I got my next period. It was really, really painful. My parents noticed that I was uh, sort of more miserable because I was in a lot of pain. I wasn't able to do as much as I usually would. Um, and then again, it was back to the GP after Christmas to ask what to do next. And they said to take my birth control pill so I was on the combined pill so it had an estrogen and progestin in it and again I'd been on that for years hadn't really had any issues it regulated my periods it didn't make them heavy um because I struggled with bleeding and anemia um so it was it was it was great I was doing fine with it but within two months my pain just got so much worse my abilities to 
do my daily activities reduced. I was missing a lot of work. I struggled to walk up the stairs on my periods. I was getting pain outside of my periods. It was a really hectic time. Eventually, my body just gave in. I started bleeding again and there was a night where my painkillers just didn't work at all. And my boyfriend said, right, we do you want to go to the hospital now? It's about 11 p.m. This would be a good time to go, you know, if we're going to go. Um, I was so apprehensive about going because I'd been online at that point about through the endometriosis forums because my ultrasound was clear and that was kind of the guidance where they're going through. And the amount of things I've heard were, emergency care hasn't been useful or it hasn't been helpful and people end up coming out more traumatized and unfortunately that was the case for me I saw an out of hours nurse who didn't necessarily listen to the background of my symptoms and the investigations I was going with she just wanted to know what was happening now and after the examination said it was musculoskeletal pain for where it was and I don't doubt part of that as a problem because I wasn't able to move very much or reduced to the house so there is going to be that pain there but that's not the root cause of why I'm in so much pain now and why stuff like codeine was not controlling my pain. And the medication that she could give me was um, an anti-inflammatory. I cannot take those because they induce cramping in me. And I was kind of made to feel like I was being a problem and because I couldn't take what she was going to give me. So I, I it's the first time I ever like shouted at my depression but I just lost my shit I was just crying I was in so I was just like you need to let me see a doctor I'm not going home like this then she did leave and go and call someone but I had to call my boyfriend from the waiting room to come and sit with me because I that was the worst panic attack I'd ever had and I've had them in the past previously is something I can manage but the, in that situation I just felt so lost and scared because this is a place where you go to for help and it just wasn't happening and it was a really really hard time it was and I was relying on the uh, Facebook group which was focused on endometriosis sufferers in the UK and that was super helpful in you know how to talk to doctors you know if they're going to refuse to do something for you you can get them to put on your medical notes why they're going to refuse that you know you can ask for second opinions you have a right to see an endometriosis specialist, you can request that. So many different helpful things, which I did not know about. It's not necessarily something the GP points out. Um, you know, it's just information that's not widely accessible. And the personal experiences of all these other women who have been through it was so, so helpful. Um, and then this year, I was still struggling uh, even after my surgery and you know I kept getting suggested endometriosis stuff on Instagram I guess you know our phones listen to us it probably heard me talking about it and searching on they things. definitely do you yeah. see it in ads and everything else when I tell you that microphone is on yeah. <laughs> even if you're not feeling like you're on the phone but the phone is on it is definitely definitely there and you kind of hit on something first I want to say how powerful it was for you to be able to be on those Facebook groups and in those mm -hmm. community spaces. And they empower you with the right questions to be able to ask, like how to talk to the doctor. Um, I thought that was very important for me. It was important because my nurse practitioner told me, go mm -hmm. to the emergency room, let them know you need imaging because of this pain. Like, because she told mm -hmm. me what to say, they went ahead and did Well, my nurse practitioner sent me. She said I needed imaging. This pain is going on. We don't know what it is. And so, you know, the CT scan and the ultrasound, like that started to happen because I was told what to say. That's important. Yeah. The second thing you said, why they are refusing. I think that's powerful, Seth. I haven't heard anyone say, get a reason why they're refusing to mm -hmm. do the things that you're asking and notate and document that. I bet that will cause a shift for some doctors. Yeah. In a room when you ask that, why are you refusing again to not give me that? I just want to make sure I get this down. So when I see the next person, I can make sure, you know what I mean? Just so I, yeah. I have a better understanding of why you believe I'm re getting refused. This should be like, that one was powerful. I love that one. And then what to actually request. Um, when you know to go in and request certain exams, certain tests, certain hormone things, it's it makes you so much more um, and powerful mm -hmm. and it makes you so much more informative. So you're like, you can't take an informed 
patient and sit there and think you can tell them anything and allow them to get away with whatever it is that you plan to do in those 10 to 15 minutes they plan to see you in the room. So I think those questions right there were valuable. And I didn't want you to go too fast over that mm -hmm. because people might need to hear these things in the event that they've been ignored through the healthcare system and they haven't been heard. Now they're coming with even more. So like guests have been helping with questions and saying document your symptoms and how long it's been happening. So when you go, you have all this information, but to then take on the assessment from yeah. them too, like that was a shift right there, Sav. Yeah. I mean, I want to, because we're touching on this in the UK, Marina coil removal, I, I was wanting mine out because I was struggling like a year after surgery. My symptoms weren't going so down. So first, tell them why you had to get that, what that is, and then talk about reversing because some people might not even know what it is that you're referring to. So um, the the typical name is the hormonal IUD. That's sort of universal. Marina is just a type of it. And I had that inserted during surgery as the hormonal pills that I was having just weren't working for me and that seemed like the next best option based on all the previous birth control I'd had and again in surgery didn't feel it uh, it can be a very extremely painful process I attempted to have it inserted before surgery but because I was in so much pain my pelvis and everything was so inflamed I couldn't tolerate the speculum exam too so they could open you up and make sure to see where the cervix is where they could place it I couldn't tolerate that so I had it done during surgery I didn't really notice the side effects straight away because you're dealing with the surgical pain your body's healing from everything like that so everything is generally quite tender and sore but it got to like five months and I was still having pain outside of my periods. My periods were still really painful. They may have been lightened a bit by the coil, but bleeding was never that big of an issue for me. But the pain was still so significant that I ended up trying other treatments like the chemical menopause. And I also tried a, another birth control pill on top of that. Um, none of those seemed to quite get rid of the pain. They dulled them to an extent that things were a little bit more manageable but it never got better so it was a lot of effort to try and get this coil removed because I wasn't going to be able to have it done in person because initially they couldn't see my string so the marina coil has some strings so the doctor can check it's in place it's not traveled anywhere um mine were never visible but I'd had ultrasounds which show it was in place it was fine it was safe and then I kept having more pains I had contraction like pains so I was like, oh, is this going to make it move? Is it going to come out? You know, all these sort of things. So I had to have more. I've had so many ultrasounds done this year. It's unbelievable just to make sure that was in place. It had dropped down a bit, but not anything too dangerous. But I was just still so distressed about any time I was having new pain or anything severe, I'm going to have to have this checked out. Internal um, ultrasounds are really painful for me. So I just didn't want to keep going through that process. And I just wanted to see what my body would be like without anything because I'd never seen the effects of my surgery with no hormonal interventions because I had the uh, coil placed in. And I knew the horror stories of getting it in was painful and I didn't want to have it out without adequate pain relief. And at that point I was taking sort of high strength opioids uh, like dihydrocodone and tramadol. Uh, just to manage my pain and to a certain extent sometimes it wouldn't even control it so mm. I was like, I can't take that before my appointment because I'm still going to feel what's happening and I also ended up developing sort of medical PTSD throughout this journey so I knew that I'm just going to be so heightened that I wanted to make this experience more comfortable for myself and I was doing my research and in the UK you can have the coil removed with gas and air so it's it's basically like laughing gas it makes you very lightheaded and it's something that's available but you have to request it they will not make they will not suggest that to you even if you are quite anxious and not all doctors are aware so I'd seen uh just a general gynecologist twice the first time she was like okay let's just do an updated imaging then we'll decide on how to remove it because if it's gravitate to a place which requires you know more invasive um interventions then they'll have to think about that but it was fine and then I went to see her again I was like I want it out with gas and air I've seen it's available at other hospitals in the UK so there's no reason why it couldn't be done here 
and she seemed a bit, bit confused about it. She's like, oh, I can just do it right now. We can have a check. And I was like, no, I want it out with this. And luckily the nurse chaperone in the room, she was like, oh, I'll check. I think we can do this on ward 31. So I was like, okay. She went into that. She's like, yeah, we can arrange for that. It'll have to be a different appointment. I was like, that's fine. I'll wait. I want this out. And if it wasn't for that nurse checking, it would have just been an uphill battle just to get this pain relief. And if anything, if you you do Google uh, myelina core removal with gas and air in the UK, um, there's a certain NHS trust that will come up and you can just you could just save that document and just show them, look, it's available at this hospital. Why can't you do it here? I'm sure you have gas and air in this hospital. There will be the facilities to do this. And it'll be hard for them to say, say no because it is available, but it's not widely known and I had to do my own research. And by having that, my removal experience was painless. Like, I Go have a gas and air. Yeah, I that's what I'm talking about. That's amazing. And see, we don't have that within like the U.S. healthcare system. But the fact that you're still showing up with the documentation and advocating for yourself. And that goes back to what you talked about in regards to like the challenges of being heard. So you mentioned before, like not re not knowing anything about endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome. We talked about it, like not being in school yeah. um, and how it impacted like our diagnosis journey, not knowing anything and thinking things are normal or it's just our normal and it's really not normal. How did this lack of information affect you and what motivated you to keep pushing for answers, even when you felt your voice was unheard? And you've already kind of gave us a few examples. Calling for your boyfriend when you're in there about to have this panic attack because they're not listening to you one time in the ER. Now you're in here and you're saying, I need this laughing gas thing to help me with the removal of this. You're not going to do it without it. I'm not going to be in pain. Like, talk to us about what kept you motivated and making sure that your voice was heard as you navigate these challenges. So there was a big time difference between the two. So the when I had that panic attack and I, that was the first time I went into hospital, that was... February 2023 this sort of removal period um like advocating for it was uh, I want to say between March and May 2024 uh, my appointments were around that time it, there's a lot of appointments so I think that's roughly about the time I had at that time been online I'd heard about you know other women really advocating for the removal because advocating for removal itself is very very hard with endometriosis because you'll be told i was told when i first started having issues with it that i'd be worse off without it well it, they are so wrong since i've had it out i felt so much better not only pain wise but emotionally and mentally but they like after a year and nobody was willing to say oh maybe this is the issue if we take this out because I tried all the, I've tried, I tried the chemical menopause, I tried a different pill. The whole problem still here during that whole time is this coil. Nobody wanted to, to do that because they've seen it as like a great pain management thing for endometriosis. And I've seen it works, works really well for some people, but for a lot it doesn't. And for me, I, I deep down knew it wasn't. And it felt very validating once it was out because the whole sort of period I felt so anxious, like what if I'm making the wrong decision? you know, it's such a painful thing to have put in again, it would be a very difficult process. But I'm glad I stuck with it. And that's because I spoke to other women about their experiences, what it was like, um, having it removed, how they asked for it, you know, I think it was on the endo subreddit that I actually found out that you can have sort of gas and air, some people had um, local anesthetic, I think it depends on where you are and what your doctors will offer you if you do ask enough. But it, if it wasn't for the online communities, I wouldn't have been able to find out this information, advocate as hard for myself as possible. I mean, I cried throughout the whole thing. I did have a panic attack while I was trying to advocate for myself, but I got it. And that's 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 sort of the point. Like, if you're there's don't be afraid to be crying or emotional, whatever it is, because granted, I had a hella load of hormones in me, so that's gonna make me feel a lot worse and you know, all the sort of trauma behind it. But that doesn't mean you can't get your voice out. Like I remember reading a quote which says, speak even if your voice shakes, well, I'm gonna cry and I'm gonna get out, I need to eventually. And there is no rush, like these appointments are for you. Take the time you need to get out what you need to say. And I always find it easy, easier um, 
you know, I'll take my pain journal with me. I'll have rough notes or I will then look at the summary of time since I've last seen the doctor to now and then write down a few notes so my brain's got it in place. You know, if you have someone that can go with you, my boyfriend will usually write down the notes of what I want to say and then he'll go through and tick stuff to make sure I've said it and then he will suggest to me, you know, oh, you haven't said this, do you still want to talk about it? Like, he won't necessarily talk, but he will... Yeah, uh, that is me amazing! My brain is, like, my brain is, like, soup most of the time because there's so much to remember. That is you, good that he really does that. Like, yeah. that is... I absolutely love that for you because it's, like, you have your own... You just talked about it. You had your own pain journal. You have your notes. You're adding things on why you're being refused certain stuff and you're asking for certain things and why they're not happening. You're having your documentation. But then you have an empowered support system that is going with you and say, well, babe, I understand you didn't say some of these things. Did you still want to discuss these? Like he is like, mm -hmm. that is absolutely amazing. And I let's just take a moment to appreciate those who really know how to show up and have no problem showing up as advocates mm -hmm. um, to be support systems with endometriosis, adenomyosis, PCOS, because that matters. Because when you feel isolated, you feel like your voice isn't heard, you feel like you're not getting help, you feel like your body's attacking you, you feel like there's everything against you, yeah. to have that breath of fresh air or that opportunity to kind of lean on somebody else when you can't really lean on your body or depend on your body um, at a certain point, it's a beautiful thing. And that that's just a blessing for you. And I'm just so grateful you have that. And I hope other people um, have spouses and partners and loved ones that care mm -hmm. about them just as much that they're adamant about taking notes and discussing things with you. So when they do go to the appointments or to the surgeries or the procedures, they're in there just as informed as you are. When you got two people taking notes yeah. and documenting, it's a whole nother vibe for those healthcare providers when you're yeah. in there to kind of do the things that you're doing. And I think you're about to say something, but I have something else that I wanted okay. to hit on. Go ahead. Did you want to add on to something? Oh, yeah, oh. definitely. Like, if you can have someone that can come with you to your appointment, especially someone that knows you, well, like, sees you, either someone that lives with you or sees you very regularly or is in contact with you regularly and understands and knows what you're going through. Because I think, I know I have, and I know a lot of people then make sure will tend to downplay things a little bit because we're so used to managing and masking daily things because we don't want to let the illness get the best of us, that you can there might be subtle ways of things that you can't do or you don't do or you know your behaviors or how you appear that you might not necessarily notice but someone else does and that's just another thing to show to the doctor as well you know this is how it's impacting this person this is how i've seen them change and it just helps your case a little bit and i like that you said that it's also standing in your truth even if somebody doesn't believe in your pain or diminishes or my news i remember um when I first got diagnosed and I had my surgery and I was, you know, back into, you know, my home, my space. And I remember um, the person I was living with at the time was just kind of like, yeah, well, my mama had something like this and it wasn't all of that. Or my mom. And it ended up being like they had fibroids. And, you know, that was just it was like the diagnosis, the conditions, the symptoms, the treatments. All of this hits people differently and you don't yeah. really know exactly what they're experiencing. So when people are easy to dismiss your pain, dismiss the severity of how you feel and what you feel, those people don't deserve to be that close to you yeah. because you need a strong system within yourself first. And then you need people who really love on you, care about you and aren't trying to go back and forth with you on how you feel and what it is you need in order for yourself to feel comfortable moving forward to heal in the best way. So environments matter. Um, but you hit on something else. If you talked about like having a panic attack, you talked about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD from, you know, your medical experiences. And I think you, I remember you telling me that you, you did a mental health free program. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about that mental health free program and being able to actually meet a therapist who also had endo and yeah. it was relatable. Talk about that mental health free program. What led you to um, seek uh, that opportunity to go and get that mental health treatment? Because at this point and I, in the conversation, I just want y'all to know that because of this type of pain and the experiences we have just with not only our body, but the healthcare system and getting treated and advocating for ourselves, it plays a toll on your mental health. And so when I say help with eliminating distress, 
it's because there's so much you have to go through and navigate in regards to your emotions and your body and your thoughts and your beliefs and your feelings. This is a lot to take on. Like it's not an a easy fate. So Sad, talk, talk, talk to us about what led you to that mental health program. So it was my best friend, actually. So she works in mental health and the company that she was working at, they were offering free therapy and it was with people that were training to be counsellors. I think it was six to eight weeks, I want to say, or six to eight sessions at least. And um, she asked me, do you know anyone who needs it? And I was like, huh, me? <laughs> that, that was it. I was like, I could. Um, it was... It was the end of last year. Again, I was really, really struggling, I think, um, with my body not being, I suppose, as well as I thought it'd be after surgery and still having to navigate sort of medical appointments, trying to get back to my daily life. And I thought, okay, you know, it's free. I can't afford to be paying to see someone on the wait list. Um, in the NHS at the current moment for mental health support is really, really long. It can be like eight weeks. So um, this seemed like a good thing to take advantage of. And I had my assessment call and when I was talking about my problems with um, the counsellor that I ended up being assigned to, she was like, you know, I've been through the process myself so I can understand this and, you know, we can help with the panic attacks because that's what was really distressing me. Um, at that point, whenever I had new pelvic pain, and I'd go to the toilet, I was bleeding, like I was bleeding quite regularly, it would distress me, I'd feel my body going into panic, and I didn't want to be always in tears at the sight of pain, because when my pain was super high, I wasn't like that, but I don't know what, I guess, you think that after surgery, your body will be better, even though I know that's necessarily the case, but you hope, and then when it was quite, still feeling like it was just as bad it was a lot to take on and I feel like I was more receptive to that therapy than I have been in the past for other types because this person truly understood to a T what it was like to have not only live with this illness but go through the medical system which can be really really tough and uh, there was an understanding like you know I'm gonna struggle on certain days there might be days you know we might just decide this week or next week I'm going to try and work in the office I'm feeling all right now but something has suddenly come down the day before the day of and I feel like shit and I can't go in and you know managing that and you know it was you know going through different coping techniques and you know she's like here's a list of like 10 to 20 they might not all work for you but try a few out see what you like and um there's a really sort of importance on refocusing on activities in the home that I used to enjoy doing that I can do because I was still sort of resided to the house more than I would like to have been. And, you know, I found instead of just uh, sort of seeing in front of the TV or, you know, sometimes you're so tired and just lying in bed and everything's in pain. Well, I really enjoyed reading. My brain is still fine at that point. So I could, you know, read for a couple of hours or, and I'd been home but I'd be reading and I'd been I'd be doing something that was enjoyable. And it was just rediscovering those small activities that I could do at home that I could still so be. Let's talk about it. some of those, Seth, because this is a big thing. Um, you you got a free mental health program. She's relatable. She has endometriosis. And I know you were telling me um before talking about like grounding techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, so talk a little bit about some of these practices that might have been on the the list that really work for you, that allowed you to kind of be supported in your um with mental health and also helped you with your actual endo pain. Like what were some of the ones that really stood out for you? So I got back into the habit of doing it. I fell out of journaling. But I did. And then at the end of sort of each each sort of thing, I'd just write how I was feeling the day, what happened, what was good, what was bad. But I'd end it on sort of five good things that happened the day and they could just be something as simple as it was really sunny and I really enjoyed that. You know, I got out in the garden. Um, my cat did something stupid that made me laugh. You know, um, and then to bigger things like, oh, I was able to, to go out to the shops by myself today um that might not seem you know huge in the grand scheme of things but for me that's like a little bit of my independence in writing you know uh making all my own meals again 
not something I can always do. And even if it was just something simple as, I don't know, some pasta or something, it was I, something I did for myself. And noting those things down so then I end my day on something that is good because obviously I, you want, I only tend to journal at that point when things were bad, because I know, right, when things are good as well, because then there's, you can reflect and go back and like for me going through these things, I, you know, other people can tell me, you know, my boyfriend can tell me, you know, you did this, you did really well today. And we're having that physical evidence for myself saying this, that's really helpful. Uh, again, writing is something I get on well with. And one of them was to write a letter to yourself to read when you're in this sort of state of distress, when you're panicked, when you're feeling low. And that's really helpful because it's coming from me. So I, it's, it's a bit more believable. Like I, I trust me. <laughs> And again, like, I still go back to it. You know, it's something I would like to sort of rewrite and review now. Things have changed. Um, so do you write the letters to yourself when you're feeling good? And so then that way, when you're feeling bad, you come back and revisit? Yeah. So I I'm love feeling, it. That's yeah. awesome. Staff. So you got journaling. And that's just journaling when I'm feeling good and when I'm feeling bad. Then you had your gratitude journaling, talking about like five things you really just were grateful for over the day. Um, you wrote down or you felt good about the things that you were able to do independent and not have to have somebody come along with you. Uh, meal prepping, something you enjoy having to do yeah. alone, things that sometimes you can't do by yourself. I think those are some awesome things that kind of like support you in regards to your mental health and show up for yourself. Um, but I absolutely love when I'm feeling good, writing letters to myself. So that yeah, way, when yeah. I'm feeling low, um, I can read those letters to myself. That 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 right there is powerful within itself, Seth. And I, I appreciate you sharing um, those techniques. Can you give just a little advice to people um, who might be struggling to find relief for their symptoms um, in regards to what they could potentially be doing in regards to like grounding techniques or support them with mental health? I think when obviously when you're managing pain it's really really hard and mental health does fall to the wayside it's fallen to the wayside for me recently I've noticed and and it is it's hard because the physical pain is so dominating that you can forget about how it feels mentally but it's finding the little things that you do enjoy doing that don't require a lot of physical exertion so at the moment I'm struggling really, really quite badly with migraines and tension mm. headaches, vertigo. So I have been having visual problems. So it means stuff like reading that I can't normally do. So instead, there are audiobooks, there are podcasts, and I can tolerate those a little bit better. So even if I am just lying in a dark room, uh, I can still listen to things that are interesting. Like I love a, a history podcast and, you know, just finding those little things can help and you know there I have recently re decided to seek mental health support again it is a long waiting list but I have done it now and I'm on that list and it'll it may be like eight weeks but that's fine in the meantime I can you know revisit the techniques that I learn um making sure that I get movement in I am um, I've been so scared of doing movement because I'm scared of hurting my body, but I've been, again, working with a trainer who specializes in women's health and works with women after surgery and, you know, works with endo and all these other conditions. So having that guidance and what to do and, you know, when to rest. And, you know, if there's a few sort of YouTube videos, which have uh, for pelvic exercises and abdominal sort of relief and, there's a video, I think there's one that I do that's seven minutes long. It's not long at all, but it's enough for me to feel a bit of relief. It's quiet time. It's something I've done for myself. And it's usually something I can do when I'm in quite high pain, regardless of what that pain is, because it involves mostly being lay on the floor. So, you know, it's finding those little things because once you've done that one activity, your brain is like, oh my God, I've done this, even though I feel like absolute crap. But then you've done, say, that seven minute yoga video, you've, you know, done a face mask or whatever, whatever it is. And, you know, there are 
don't be afraid to lean on people you are not a burden it's very hard not to feel like that because of sort of the physical lack of sort of independence that you have and it can feel like oh I'm talking about this too much but that is your your life you know you are going to struggle with these things and your friends your partners your family they're gonna you know the ones that do show up for you and do care for you are gonna want to hear it you think of yourself as if you were your friend you'd want them to talk to you about something so don't feel like you can't and you know it may be a little bit hard if you can't if you don't feel like you can talk to someone write everything out on a piece of paper whatever it is get it out of you some way because it's not good keeping it in because that's where you know the sudden sort of short bursts of break breakdowns do happen because you're not getting it out and it's something I'm I've had to learn I'm still learning to do so like don't beat yourself up about if things go wrong or if you don't you know if you have a breakdown whatever it is if you're struggling we're all human beings we're not going to get everything right but I think just remembering that you are trying that that's enough it is um and then sometimes not even you're trying you're doing it you're making it every single day still surviving might not feel like you're thriving but you're surviving some days you are thriving because you get to do those things that you really wanted to do and your body shows up with you um in a good way for you to do those things um so I, i'm all for that and give yourself grace i love that you talked about you know the reality of Because I've been in so much pain, I don't want to trigger more pain by just moving, even though I know I'm supposed to move and moving helps. Movement is key uh, with endometriosis, but also finding the right movement. Like running is not my my vibe (laughs) with endometriosis, but um, on another podcast episode, Deshonda talked about she loves running. Nadia talked about she loves running. And so there are endo people who love to run and it does good for their body. For me, it does not. I'm a walker. Yeah, um, I'm a walker. And every now and then, depending on which phase of my cycle I'm on, I might have a burst of energy where I might be able to jog across the street where like the sidewalks, you know, separate yeah. or something like that. Or if Spencer wants to pick up a good pace, I might get in like a few seconds of a jog yeah. and then it's back to our good power walk. Like I'm not a runner because I start to feel it in that left side of my adenomyosis yeah. and it doesn't make me feel comfortable. Also, I'm not one for high intensity. There's some people yeah. with endometriosis that can do high intensity workouts. That's not me. So um, one, I would say check out um, Bear's Fitness. Uh, he did an episode. He's a fitness trainer. His wife has PCOS. He's mm-hmm. worked with people with endometriosis, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, fibroids. He's worked with women with those conditions. And so he talks about the importance of how to um, uh, approach movement, um, mindful movement. For people in that, so definitely check out that episode, Saf, and anybody that's listening. Yeah. And why, my, why we're here, y'all, make sure if you're listening on YouTube that you subscribe to the channel, like this, and let us know what takeaways, what value you're getting from this conversation, or what just stood out to you that you never even know that people are experiencing with endometriosis in our stories that we're sharing. So make sure you comment and let us know what you're getting out of this episode. Engage with us so we'll understand and know what you're talking about. And we can dive in and respond to your comments as well. But make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on Spotify, you can leave comments now too, I heard. So definitely go ahead and leave your comments as well and make sure you're following the podcast. And if you're on Apple, give a good rating and make sure you are following. Um, Staff, you also talked about um, you also talked about YouTube and finding a seven minute video. Mm-hmm. Working out doesn't mean you have to do 30 minutes, mm-hmm. an hour worth of movement. Movement heals um, the body and the body needs to move and it needs to be able to reduce the tension that you stay in. Um, and so I'm so happy that you found a seven minute YouTube video and you did it and you survived and you like, yeah. oh, my body did okay too. I can do this again. And it makes you want to keep doing it. Because one, you survive. Two, you're enjoying the benefits. And three, you know it's important for you to do. Um, And so I'm glad that you did that and you found something that was safe for you. And I love the fact that you talked about the trauma you felt being scared to even do anything Mm -hmm. at all. Um, And so I'm proud of you um, for that. Another thing that I love that you talked about is write it. Write it and get it out. Because if you don't, 
the body keeps score. It's going to stay in your mindset. It's going to lack what you are able to recall. Remember your creativity, the love, the positive thoughts, everything, the affirmations, all of that gets stunted because you're typically holding in stuff that needs to be released. So if you can't say it and speak it, write it out and get it out of you so you can continue to show up in the next few moments of your life, the most vibrant and healthiest you that you can because you got it out. So I love that you talked about that too. But the most important thing that you Mm -hmm. said, staff, and all of that was you are not a burden. I am so happy you took that thought out of anybody's head that might have been hearing that, knowing that they have polycystic ovary syndrome, adenomyosis, endometriosis, fibroids. You took it out of them and say, you are not a burden. A lot of times, we are still figuring out how to show up for us every single day and understand what's going on with our body and then love ourselves and our body enough to say, I want us to heal together and move forward and go after this life that I know we deserve to reverse symptoms and reverse what all this condition is causing us every single day. But to not feel like a burden could be a really hard task for people. And I'm so glad that you put that out there for people to know that they are not a burden. Something you told me, Seth, um, in regards to like the your mental health um, therapist in that program, and we were talking about it because I was like, I started with the let your body, let the belly hang, let the belly hang, yeah. let the belly hang, let the belly hang. It was the importance of body scans, um, and so we were talking about that before, and I was just like um, talking about it with the physical therapist, and she was like, we hold so much tension in our body mm-hmm. that we have to learn how to relax and release, and it was in the deep breathing. And in the slow exhale, you start to realize where your your tension is. Even sitting here um, doing this podcast with you and having this episode, like I felt tension in my stomach, like when I'm I'm waiting and I'm listening or something happened. I'm like, oh, relax, let it go. And like you might even see me in in the camera just kind of like melt back in my seat because I'm realizing I'm tense. Y'all tension is real in the body. Um, do body scans as often as you can think about it, whether you're driving, you're riding, you're just sitting in a chair, you're laying down in your bed. It is very, very common for you to hold tension in your body. So it's important to do body scans. And so I just really wanted to make sure we uh, put that out there as well, because me and Sav kind of laughed about that before. Um, But I just wanted to put that, add that as a tip out there for you when you're thinking about um, ways to show up for you. And those techniques that will work to help reduce pain, I think that's kind of what um, I wanted to make sure we say. So, Seth, you launched Brown Girl Endo to address the lack of South Asian yeah. representation in endometriosis advocacy spaces. What challenges did you face in creating your platform and how has it helped build a community for those felt unseen and heard? And y'all, Saf doesn't just have an Instagram. She also has a website where she has her blogs too. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah. So I think it was more like I didn't feel like, I don't know. I just felt like starting another Instagram to talk about that, it would be opening myself up in a way that would have to be very vulnerable with basically anybody because that's anyone who can access the internet. But as I was getting sort of it recommended stuff on Instagram, basically every person that I saw talking about endometriosis that got recommended to me was white. That that was the case. And I was like, you know, it's it's not a white it's it's not a white disease. You know, reading statistics, you know, there was one that came up that said it's ninefold present in Asian women well well where 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 are the women I can't find them so I started the Instagram and that's how I ended up coming across Sisters which is a UK based charity and it's um, run by a woman of colour and the founder I think she is she's South Asian as well so it's seeing people like her who'd clearly been around for a very long time but I just hadn't come across it and I think that's part in you know our education system you don't know about these like charities that exist you know we we are aware of charities you know schools bring them in to do sort of fundraising things but we don't know about sort of women's health focused ones and through that you know i came across you know um endo black ink i actually came across them on linkedin because i came across the founder on there i can't remember how but i did and that was really great to see because again, everything was just the face of enemy shows seemed to be very white. And I was like, I can't 
there's certain aspects of this that I can't really, I can relate to the physical pain that you're going through. I can relate to the experiences that you go through with medical professionals, but I cannot relate. There's a certain point where a barrier is there because, you know, um, I grew up in a household where, you know, period talk was only for women. So, you know, when, if I was having period pains, you know, I just say I was having stomach pains to my dad. That was it. You know, there was nothing beyond that. But as my health got seriously bad, I had to explain to him that this is what I think the condition is. This is where it's relating to, you know, explaining what endometriosis is. Now I can talk about, you know, from having period pains, you know, what's, you know, the pains that are hurting, the medical treatments that I'm going through, such as, you know, when I went through the chemical menopause, all these, all of these different things I can now talk to him about because I sort of had to do it because I couldn't just keep telling my mom about it because then obviously she's going to tell my dad but I should be able to do that like I at that point was 25 I should be able to talk about this and I think it was just part of my own barriers it's never like I couldn't talk to them it's just it just never was it was always around women and my mom was always very open with me and my sister but it was always on the women's side of things but at the end of the day you know my I'm my dad's daughter you know um there are going to be men that, you know, have wives, have daughters, you know, they have, we have to be able to have this conversation with all genders. And that was a difficult thing. And, you know, how uh, people of colour show pain is different. We are like, I know this is true because, you know, I've seen in waiting rooms, there's this difference. I, 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 I just, I think partly being introverted and partly being the way I've grown up, you know, it's no sort of screaming or shouting or, you know, that sort of thing that's just not in me. You know, we have a tendency to hold more pain than we need to, but that's because, you know, our ancestors went through things that way, were way more difficult. Like my grandparents emigrated to the UK. They left their families behind and started new families. Like, that is a very hard life. So I think there's just a natural way where we're just not told to show physical pain in a certain way. And because no one really talks about especially women don't talk about the problems that they're having with their menstrual health or whatever it may be because there's always the nature especially my culture for it to be talking about fertility straight away like oh you have this will you be able to still have children and that's not even on the forefront of my mind because I'm still trying to grapple with this condition and the very fact of the matter I don't know and it can be a different kind of process for women with endometriosis and it leads to more invasive questions so, I so agree. Like, I hate when they ask that question. Yeah. Like, why is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Like, why are we talking about children right now? What about this person? Like yeah. the person who would have to have the child. And will I still be feeling the way I'm feeling right now while also raising a child? Like, focus on me first. Yeah. And then we'll get into the possibility on if I want to have a, my own biological child later down the road. Like, is that pertinent? Is this a part of your training yeah. to ask these questions first? Like, you didn't even ask me how I was feeling yet. Yeah. Like, and what direction we were going in before you automatically go in. But you want to have a child? Like that That right there just kind of. Yeah. It, it blows me. But I like that you talked about like you saw Endo Black on LinkedIn. For me, it was the first yeah. thing like when I went in and I started typing in like endometriosis and like Instagram during the pandemic right mm -hmm. after I had surgery. And they told me what all it was. And I saw it and it was helpful to go and look at posts and look at the different symptoms people were having because then I could relate. I was like, yep, yep, mm, no. Dang, <laughs> every single day, <laughs> period, that isn't yeah. me. Like, oh, glory. Like, I was just going through all the different things. And so it does matter when it comes to representation and seeing, you know, what this really is and what it looks like for everybody else because it looks different. And that's the reason why we have this safe space of the Empire Place Empire Lives podcast, because everybody's journey is different. Nobody's journey looks the same. Um, and that's the interesting part about endometriosis, because it says endometriosis isn't the same in everybody's life and it's not going to feel, look the same. And so we have to find ways to navigate this thing um, to the best of our ability. So I guess my next question will be, Seth, like as a... BIPOC or Black Indigenous Person of Color woman, like you face unique hurdles in your health journey. What advice do you have for other individuals um, who may be hesitant to share their stories and how can they find strength to speak up and advocate for themselves? 
Uh, every single voice matters, but especially that of uh, BIPOC folks, because, you know, just seeing someone that looks like you makes such a difference. Like, so I did my undergrad degree in um, history and American studies, and I love film. So I did mine on uh, racism in Hollywood film and television. And one of the studies that really still sticks with me to this day is this visibility does matter because if we're constantly seeing stories for example which are centered around white people or centered around BIPOC people and their stereotypical versions that's all we're seeing and that sort of stereotyping a viewpoint of you know this is what this person must be like but no we're all very different and we need to see more BIPOC folks in this space especially you know, my non-binary people, because the amount of times I've seen a few few of my followers who seem so distressed because of the use of such gendered language, it makes me feel so upset because, you know, we're already struggling with so much with this illness, feeling like we're not listened by doctors, you know, we're not being seen or heard. By the matter of choosing our language to make it more gender neutral, it makes somebody else feel seen and heard. It makes someone else feel like, feel they're included in this community it's such a wide region community you now i learned from instagram endometriosis can be present in men i didn't know that was true i didn't even think about it but there was a user was talking about how it's you know her i think her grandfather and her uncle both had it but it was only proven after sort of the tissue was examined so there is so many groups that can be affected by this and you know the trans people and non-binary people were already struggling with so many things in terms of medical barriers you know if we as a community can't slightly adapt our language to make them feel seen and heard you know platforming and sharing you know these people's voices and that's what you know I've tried to do um with my migraines it's been a little bit more hard to carry on with this project but a big part of what I wanted to do was always share um creators from uh by backgrounds because you know these accounts are hard to find like it's taken it's it they're not the easiest to find it took me a while to find you know charities and then the founders and then certain personalities doctors that are from these backgrounds talking about these issues and it makes such a big difference like um i remember coming across um my big fat South Asian menopause and this was someone that looked like they could be one of my aunties talking about all of these issues that I wish you know people in my family would talk about again you know it's hard to talk about these issues and you know I was like this is someone you know if I shared her account with my mom because like, this is someone my mom could relate to and it was just so amazing to feel because I was like you know we do exist they are out there might be a little bit harder to find but once you start following a few, the rest appear. And, you know, there are so many great creators out there. And, you know, there are so many stories that I've heard where race directly does impact, you know, people's diagnosis journeys, whether it's been directly said to them in certain ways or, you know, um, they've been perceived to be able to hold a certain amount of pain more than, say, their white counterparts. Like, it is really, really rough to see and read these stories but the more that are there the more we can change that narrative and we can we can see each other we can talk to each other there is that support because there is such a difference being able to talk to someone who has gone through what you've been through and understands those sort of racial tendencies or uh, nuances to the journey because there are times where um you know you do have to think are they not listening to me because I'm a woman or because I'm Pakistani or is it because of both? Especially when, you know, the hosp- the area that I live in is very- it's mostly white area. A lot of the doctors I've come across have been white. A lot of the consultants are white. So it is difficult when you're faced with that. And, you know, it's not always the case in my endometriosis specialist that I saw that she's my surgery is a white man. It, it Sometimes it doesn't matter, but sometimes it can make you feel that way um like the first hospital admission that i'd gone through um when i'd seen the doctor at the night she was a black woman she was like look i'm really sorry there isn't much that i can do in emergency care for you right now but what i will do is i will give you the morphine to help you you know 
cope with the pain tonight. I'll re-refer you back to gynecology, telling you, telling them that you've been here, that you need to see them, that you need the surgery. And, you know, there are times where, you know, when I've been approached by doctors that are women of colour, I felt more empathy being showed towards me in a hospital setting. In my GPs, doesn't really matter what they look like. They've all been very good and very lucky in that sense. But in that scenario, when you are so scared and you are so vulnerable, sometimes that does make a difference. And, you know, there are recent studies that have shown, you know, women doctors are generally better or patients survive surgery more with women doctors. So there is... I think because it's there. relatable. I think that's re because it can be definitely relatable. Um, yeah. When you can relate to that type of pain, you can relate to having issues and wanting to be heard. And I think that's also why some of them are even in the role in the position that they're in because they want to help. They want to be that person to be a representative, to be able to push things forward to, for people to get the right care. So I do believe that there are people out there in the healthcare system that are truly yeah. wanting to help, know enough about endometriosis, educated themselves on it, have excision specialists that are really in particular with the chronic condition. So I'll definitely, we're both grateful um, for that. But I love that you said that it's important for every voice to be heard because mm -hmm. your voice matters. And you never know if you're the voice that helps somebody else. But more importantly, when you hear your voice, speaking how it helps you keep going yeah. and i think that is even more important than um showing up for somebody else it's showing up for you and um that's what you see right now on this screen if you're watching on youtube and the virtual uh the visual aspect of this podcast episode and if you're listening that's what you're still hearing right now is two uh people showing up for themselves, but at the same time, sharing their stories in hopes that not only are they hearing themselves to keep going and keep pushing and stay in power, but hoping that their stories empowers you as well um, to keep going or take control of your healing journey. Or if there's someone that you know who've experienced any of this, to share it with them so they know that they're loved, they're cared about, they're seen, um, and there's help for them. Um, so, Seth, I'm going to ask you this question. We're getting our last two questions. Um, how do you how do you see Brown Girl Endo evolving to continue supporting and empowering those affected by this con condition? And what empowering message do you want to leave everybody with today? So I would like to still be able to continue to platform by pop creators. That is my that is my mission, as well as you know, candidly sharing my experience through both the physical but also the mental aspects because this illness can be so hard on your mind and you can feel like you are the only one experiencing these sort of things like when I was really really going through it when my pain was really really high I struggled with suicidal thoughts because of the pain I was going mm -hmm. through and the more and more people that I followed with endometriosis the more and more this was very very common and you know I still struggle with it now if my pain is really high those thoughts are very easy to creep back in because they have been around for so long whilst I was waiting to get surgery so it's just being that open so people aren't don't don't feel lonely or you know there are certain things where you know people have read my longer form blogs and been like you know I relate to this this and this and I'm uh, first part of me is like I'm sorry you relate to this but I'm glad you feel like you've been heard because sometimes we can think are we the only we can think certain things we won't be feeling like we're the only ones going through this if you put that out there the chance are someone else is gonna be feeling that i remember reading on um i think it was my endo diaries i can't remember how exactly because there's little dots in between her name but her name is molly fitzgerald and one of her posts is your story will be someone else's survival guide and that is so important because you know through that i have found that you know, there's a condition called POTS that's very common with people with endometriosis. And I started showing symptoms of that over the summer and then being able to ask people, you know, how is it like to get diagnosed? What were your symptoms like? You know, being able to put that out there in a story and someone can say, oh, this, this and this. Have you been able to manage it until you get a diagnosis? Because 
it can be a very long time. There are lots of waiting lists for certain tests. Have you, what have you done at home? And those tips I've taken on, you know, I have electrolytes in my water, increasing my salt intake, certain things that have been able to make my daily life a little bit more manageable because someone shared that information with me. And you will have a nugget of wisdom that's not been said before, someone's not come across. And every bit of information is so helpful. And, you know, you might feel like, oh, should I start? You can start anonymously. There's so many. And you'll get so much support. It's unreal. Like, I wish I'd done it earlier because I probably would have been able to cope with things a little bit more better mentally. It's why as much as things have been hard now, I've been able to cope better because been able, there's an outlet for how I'm feeling. And I don't feel like, oh, I'm complaining again or, you know, they, because everyone else gets it everyone gets it and someone might reply with you know they'll send you messages of support because sometimes that is all you need and then sometimes you know you might want that extra help or guidance as to you know how have you managed this pain have you tried it always happens when there's like a new medication recommended you can ask has anybody tried this and people will give their experiences and it's always so helpful because googling can be so stressful there's a lot of information out there and sometimes that first-hand experience of how things are are so helpful it's how I've learned about, you know, how to prepare for different procedures. You know, there's, there is so much community out there. And I have made really good friends through it. I've met Giovanni, you know, I've been able to do this, you know, my mental well being has been easier with the illness because of the people that I've been able to connect with. And it's so international, it's so wide reaching. And, you know, there are people throwing events, you can, you know, actually connect with people in real life in your areas depending on what's available so you know not do, real life do, there do you just <laughs> do you just get online do it anonymously then you do whatever you feel comfortable with and the one thing i want people to remember rest is productive i think that's so hard to you know focus on you think you know we are in so much pain and sometimes you feel like you're always at home you're always in bed but sometimes, but you're not really because you'll be doing something else. You know, you might be doing a load of laundry, you might be doing a load of tight, you might be doing loads of things in the house, but not actually resting. And, uh, you know, there's always, I felt today, I was like, I'm going to rest because I have this podcast that I want to do. I'm going to have to limit my screen time, I'm going to have to try and manage any possible sort of migraine symptoms. And it was really hard. I, remember, I, was, I was just sat in bed and I was like, I feel okay. Yes, I might feel okay now, but if I start to do something else, I'm going to trigger, I could trigger something, just rest. And then you can do the thing that you really want to do today, that you plan to do. And it feel, you can feel that sort of restless energy. Like I feel it. And then, you know, there are other ways to get it out. I could do some stretches, do some yoga on, on my mat. I don't have to use a screen. Uh, you know, listening to a podcast, occupying myself in other ways, because I think it is so hard to rest. But it is productive because you are going to give yourself that extra energy to do something that's that you want to do to regain that strength back because you can't just keep going because you will get exhausted it happened to me I started to I started to get basically like the flu because mm. I was so run down and my body was so exhausted once I actually rested for a few days and just let my body sleep when it needed to sleep even if it meant like two or three naps in the day whatever it is now I have a bit more strength back and it's just just reminding yourself to not feel like you're being lazy because if you're being lazy you'd be enjoying it but you'd be enjoying like sort of being a couch potato or whatever it is but if you're not enjoying it then th then that's not being lazy your body is telling you something with all these signals i think in addition to that rest is essential to your well-being mm. you know um you know the the goal is especially if you're someone with chronic a chronic condition the goal is to get between seven to nine hours yeah. um of sleep and so having a good sleep hygiene is very beneficial for your overall well-being in addition to that i love that you said rest is productive that's your productive way of showing up for yourself to yeah. get what your body needs because your body is doing things when you're in a restful state um and so as well as your mind and so i'm glad that you know you talked about that and you left them with that empowering message to let them know that rest is uh, productive as well as a priority that should be within your, your healing journey. Um, so last two questions, staff, and you kind of hit on it earlier. Um, give some advice to girl dads, father figures, role models, 
um, partners, because you got you a good one, uh, spouses on how they can actually show up and be supportive for people experiencing endometriosis and PCOS like symptoms, taking it back all the way to like when we're a child to, you know, being an adult and having these types of symptoms, because some people are diagnosed and some people aren't. So still being mindful of them, give them some tips. And I know you got some good ones. Yeah, so it's very much, you, you know, I think doing that research about the condition for the person because having to constantly explain what you're going through, even when you're trying to learn what endometriosis is, what fibroids, whatever condition that is suspected, and you know, researching sort of conditions that are similar with have similar symptoms, if especially if you're waiting for the diagnosis, once you've got the diagnosis, then men you need to do the research do the research the partners whatever however you're related to the person that is going through it research it um you know my partner found out for me you know i was like it was getting to the summer when i first had my pain i was like i can't keep having my heat pad i'm just gonna sweat in this heat and then googling so cooling ways to relax you know relax muscle pain and something like that and then we came across these cool patches that you can wear you can put them basically any anywhere on your body obviously there'll be sensitive areas that you can't wear it but you can wear it pretty much everywhere and I was like this is great I'm not only am I feeling cool but my pain is being managed and you know I've worn them every time I've been on holiday or whenever it's in the summer because they are better and then I've suggested them to um in the Facebook groups and stuff like that when people are asking how to cope with you know pain in the summer so it's doing that research on you know what things can support um the person in your life whether holistically because outside of the medical side of things you're going to have to try and manage things at home certain things you know there's certain dietary changes you can make well how can you help but can you you know prepare the foods this way can you do the diet at the same time so it feels less lonely like I made my partner did the low FODMAP diet with me it was not a good time I couldn't have a lot of garlic or I couldn't have garlic or onions and I was like I didn't realize how much I loved garlic until then I was like it makes a difference um and then you know those sort of things making the experience together you know when you're when you're going out of planning activities think about how they their symptoms can be managed you know um quite often my partner says have you taken have you got your walking stick have you got this you know because it can you can, I, I just forget there's a lot of things there's lots of things to remember to have someone else to you know help remind you of these things it takes off that mental burden a little bit more and just reminding you know the person in your life you know if they feel a bit rubbish they can't do something you know rest that's that's good you know you resting I don't mind doing this because a lot of the time I can think well maybe I'm putting too much on my partner I'm really sorry you have to keep doing this and this he's like I don't mind I'd rather do the active the activities around the house like the chores that are more physically tasking so you can do the other ones so you don't feel like you aren't doing anything but also you're not putting your body through too much and maybe sometimes just asking are you asking that at the next time are you sure you're able to do this because I will think you know the first time you know I'll do it because I don't want to feel like this part I'm doing putting too much on you but also it is a lot for me and then just having that extra reassurance is a lot because this there is that big mental battle to these illnesses that make it so much more difficult. And sometimes it is just needing to hear that. And, you know, for friends, you know, uh, there are certain friendships that have fallen to the wayside because I've had to say no to things or I've not been the first one being able to start that conversation because I've not been well. But there are, I've had my, my friendship with my best friend and her fiance is gotten so much stronger because you know they've made an active part to learn about what endometriosis is uh, when I visited them they've you know thought of things already like oh I've got some extra cushions for you so you can be a bit more comfortable if you need anything just ask us you know we have these things in our house we can help to support you that way or you know if you're thinking oh we're supposed to go out for a meal we're supposed to go out shopping and you're like oh no I don't think I can do this today well how about I come to see you, you know, adjusting those plans so you can still see each other because you've still allocated time for each other. So you can adjust those plans and it's being being a bit more flexible and it's it's very hard to do. I think I find it hard 
to sort of cope with myself as someone with endometriosis and struggling with other sort of health symptoms and stuff it's it's hard to be especially if you're an anxious person change of uncertainty are a hard thing to deal with but it's all a learning curve and learning together and you know always asking questions and sometimes sometimes you don't need any advice sometimes you the I will just need to cry I will just need to be angry I'll just need to be upset and just being present to listen to that to hear the person like okay get it all out say it and well then how do we work from here even if you don't want to find a solution right now well what can we do that's going to make us feel a bit better shall we go for like a walk? shall we was- watch something should we play a game no you know divert you know you've got everything out right okay now we still feel rubbish we still feel a bit drained what can we do to bring the energy back up to feel a bit better and And that's a good point Saf, right there because um a lot of times people just need that space they're not looking for a resolution or solution they don't need you to fix anything they just need you to be there to hold space Mm -hmm. um and healthy space and as soon as that space is there it's okay, now let's go do this together. Or would you like some time to just kind of be alone to kind of reflect on that, you know? Yeah, um, especially for, the, for men, because they can be very solution-oriented, whereas for for in sort of the traditional sort of women's ends, obviously gender binaries will process differently. But if we're talking about it in this sort of specifics, you know, men are very solution-oriented. Women tend to just need to talk about it and then they'll start to feel this why, you know, female friendships uh, are such a big thing because you can just, me and my best friend, we just talk about everything and they're like, okay, we feel a bit rubbish and then we'll just talk about something mindless afterwards. But it's getting that out and some a solution sometimes can make me feel even more angry. I'm just like- Yeah, because you're not even looking for and, that. Like now you're more triggered and like, you're trying to think this is not what I'm feeling. And that just made me even more mad. So that makes sense. And then yeah. I also love that you- uh, you said ask questions. I've gotten that one before on the podcast. That's always good is to ask questions because you don't want to assume. Ask questions over assumptions any day. Um, but I also liked when you talked about um, making other plans. If the plan was for us to go out and I can't do that, let's let's adjust the plan so then we're still able to spend that time together. But you're more mindful of what it is mm-hmm. that I'm going through and how my body is showing up for me today. And I think that matters collaborating on tasks that might be a little bit more physically demanding, but then just checking to make sure. I think that's helpful. And it goes back to, like you said before, you are not a burden. Um, So just checking in and wondering as a partner, as a teammate, what is it that I can do that takes off some of that burden for you even now or for the next few you know, weeks or so, this is what I'm able to do. I have no problem doing that and reassuring that there's no problem with it. So you don't start feeling guilty or like a burden. Um, and so I like that. And then I also enjoy the diet change together. Mm. I know a lot of times endometriosis, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, fibroids, adenomyosis is an inflammatory condition. And so your body's in a state of inflammation, um, whether it's due to food, whether it's due to high distress, um, you know, there's different reasons of why your body is inflamed. And so being able to embark on healthy habits and lifestyle changes together with someone else makes it more fun, makes it rewarding. And they can benefit from being in an anti-inflammatory lifestyle as well. Like they don't have to have a certain condition or the same condition to be better um, with mindful eating habits and mindful activities and getting in movement, going on the walks with you. um, So you're not walking by yourself. That's a big thing to not have to do it um, alone, but also doing your research. But I love the cooling patches. Like I, I love that because those hot sweats, and night sweats, like I used to wake up and the bed used to be drenched. Mm-hmm. My clothes would be drenched. And this is prior to surgery before I even know what was going on. And it's like, it can get really hot. And when you're in pain and you want to put a heating pad and you're already hot, it's like, no. And sometimes it would trigger like me wanting to feel even more sick, like even yeah. more nauseous, trying to put the heat on my you know, pelvic area to try to find that relief. So I love that the cooling patches work for you. So kudos to Bay again for yeah. helping out with the research and looking into ways to have a possible solution to present to you, but you decide whether or not it was something yeah. that you want to do. And then the last question, if you could have a meal with any historical figure, who would it be and what would y'all eat? Oh, oh. I, this is interesting. 
Um, I still need full figure. I think it'd be really interesting to, um, I think because I work in healthcare comms and I look at sort of, sort of medical history facts, it would be interesting to sit down with some female scientists. So there were, there were, there were two. I think Marie Curie would be really interesting because I was like, why are you playing around with radioactivity? Like what, what led you to do that? Or, um, is Rosalind Franklin. So she was one of the women who were quite prevalent in the DNA sort of founding, but her research was taken by men and she was only later in life being acknowledged for the Nobel Prize. So understanding how she felt with all of that, you know, it'd be really, really interesting. And I would eat the food of my culture. So one of my favorite meals, my mum makes a biryani with mincemeat and she layers it with fried potatoes and caramelized onions. It is so good. She makes it when both me and my sister are at home because it's quite a it's, it's a it's a process to make. And she makes me and my sister both a, a vegetarian version. And it's it's the best it's the best meal I've ever had. Like I can eat it for days straight basically until it's finished because it is that good. And you know um it'd be really interesting to see if they I think at that time would any of them even eaten Pakistani food probably not but it is just so flavorful it's so fresh it's the it's the food I gravitate to when I, I do feel a bit rubbish so if I'm able if I'm well enough I will batch cook a few things like that a few, few foods from my childhood love them in the freezer then when I feel a bit rubbish I'm like oh I could just have this because they are they are sort of they are quite labor. There are labor intensive. You can do them quickly, but they're not as good. It's always my mom always says always about letting the the onions break down to the really jammy. Because if if you do don't do them as long, if the flavor isn't there, and I can tell, I can tell when I made it too quickly. That's if not you have my mouth watering, and you know yeah. I haven't had cooked food in like <laughs> days, and I'm just like, oh my goodness, like my cheeks are just going yeah. in these caramelized onions and that's all I even got out of it and I heard <laughs> potatoes too but it's just like oh my goodness okay well let the people know where they can find you Seth so they can find me on Instagram at Brand Galando. I also have a TikTok which I don't use as much but Instagram is where you can find me my website is wordsbysaf.com and it's where I'll write longer form blogs I usually write on the experiences I'm going through, whether, you know, it's my endometriosis journey at this point, uh, my mental health experiences. And I also share recipes on there. I need to write some more up, but there's a few of like my childhood favorites that I had made vegan. Cause at the time that's, that's where my diet was. I now have reintroduced fish, but I predominantly eat a plant-based diet still because my partner is vegan. So we, sh most of our, most of my meals are that way. I don't eat meat. So and it's been a really fun way to experiment, especially with sweets, to make them uh, vegan because that is where like the science side of things, it's easy to swap out your meat version or whatever is in a savory dish. But in sweets, it's hard to find, like it took me ages to find a really good like cookie recipe that just, I don't know what happened once, they would just sort of disintegrate when I picked them up because of a recipe I found. Like, so uh, making these sort of recipes from my culture a bit more accessible and again, you know, some people have dairy allergies, you know, there's all sorts of things where if you want to limit sort of these things in your diet, there are there are alternatives that do taste just as good. Like I wouldn't share it if it didn't taste good. I got you. I did not know you were plant based. Have you seen a, a difference in like how you feel with a plant based lifestyle? So when I had my symptoms first shown, I think I was so I was already vegetarian and then um, as I moved in my partner and as we, as our relationship became serious and I ended up by default becoming vegan because we would be sharing a lot of the same food. So it's having the same sort of things. So um, I cut meat pretty soon because I didn't eat red meat because it would flower up my IBS. And then after a while living on my own again, I just didn't, I didn't feel the need to have chicken or anything. And then when I did have it again, I felt those symptoms flare up again. So um, meat is a no-go um then I in the last sort of 
couple of months, I reintroduced eggs into my diet because I was finding it hard to get a sort of enough protein or do like quicker meals for me that were sort of plant based at that time. And now I've reintroduced fish again. I have it sort of sparing me maybe for my the meals that I'd have my mostly lunch time, but I don't really ha- I don't have dairy, and that's been good. Like um, in terms of milk cheeses and that I do feel like I've changed in terms of sort of sort of hot wheats so I went from and when having like tacos and stuff like that coming the corn versions and it does make a difference because I don't feel as bloated um that's the one big thing I learned from the low FODMAP diet was you know the reduction in sort of differences between different kinds of carbs that you can have so having the corn tortillas that was a really easy swap they're available in like the supermarkets so it wasn't like i had to really outsource it whole grain pastas and um uh breads again it it made things a little bit easier and it's just it's just finding those things it can be really hard and there is a lot of pressure to follow lots of different diets i know there's the extreme anti-inflammatory diet that went around it's uh, it's not as it's not going as around as much now but you know there can be for the pressure like you know oh it's worked really well for someone you know I should do it but you have to think the person that's doing that's that's able to show you every day what they're doing film everything you know if that's their full-time job doing that then yes they can do that but if you're struggling with an illness you know you have to look after yourself you're the only one preparing your food it can be really hard it can be really overwhelming to do but you can take sort of um things from these diets so what i did not or you can get you a healthy habits and lifestyle coach and she can definitely help you simplify those things very easily to make it work for you based on the things that you like and that's something that i absolutely love to do is i like to make things um anti-inflammatory but i like it based off what you have a taste for what you already have and make the experience yours because it's my healing it's my journey it's your healing is your journey what works for me what works for staff may not work for you and so the goal is really approaching it with an open mind to figuring out what will work for you and giving it enough time to see how your body responds to it and so you heard staff just say like meat causes her 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 inflammation her pain to be triggered Um, with certain types of meat and now she's reintroducing so she kind of did like an elimination for a while Mm -hmm. and started reintroducing to see how things responded to her body but you definitely have to find what works for you but thank you Seth for being an amazing guest on the Empire Place Empire Lives podcast the first Pakistani guest on the podcast so shout out not the first UK guest but the second and so that's really awesome um and I really really appreciate um you take an opportunity to uh, show up, share your story, be transparent, and then also just be representative in different spaces. And so all of her information will be linked in the description of this video. Also, you can find some very good, valuable information in other links of this video, including my M to the third degree healing empowerment formula, mindset, mindful eating and movement. And we talked about all three of those things here today um, as a part of how it shows up in our own personal journeys. But definitely click some links. We also talked about community. And so if you're interested in a community, you must first know what it is that you want to get out of a community. And so I have an interest form in the description of this video and go through and explore what it is, respond, think about all the things you would want into a community um, because finding the right community for you is ideal. It is ideal for you to get it in there, y'all. Thank you for joining in to another episode of the Empower Plates Empowered Lives podcast. We love you. We thank you. But most importantly, thanks for vibing with us, y'all.